Good morning. Welcome to Baptist Women's Sunday. We will now come into God's presence with quiet prayer music. I invite the congregation to put aside their worldly distractions and turn your attention to God. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name on Most High. Heavenly Father, our provider, our maker, and our protector, through your goodness we are alive and healthy enough to gather and worship you. We praise you for all that you have given us, and thank you in Jesus' name, Holy Lord, we commit all of our good deeds to you, and ask that everything we do be to your glory, forever and ever, amen.
The scripture this morning is taken from 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a claiming, clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. Amen. As a fire is meant for burning, hymn number 551 in your hymn books, and the words are on the screen. Stand as you are able, please. As a fire is meant for burning with a bright and warming flame, so the church is meant for mission, giving glory to God's name. Not to preach our creeds or customs, but to build a bridge of care. We join hands across the nations, finding neighbors everywhere. We are learners, we are teachers, we are pilgrims on the way. We are seekers, we are givers, we are vessels made of clay. By our gentle, loving actions, we would show that Christ is light. In a humble, listening spirit, we would live to God's delight. As a green bud in the springtime is a sign of life renewed, so may we be signs of oneness, mitters people's many hued. As a rainbow lights the heavens when a storm is past and gone, May our lives reflect the radiance of God's new and glorious dawn. Let us pray. Father, we come to you this morning full of praise and thanksgiving for all the blessings we receive. We watch with horror the slaughter of Christians just like we are, but we come here feeling safe. O oh, dear Lord, bless those who, because of their faith, have lost loved ones and who will live in fear for a great long time. Give them great faith and comfort. We see floods and storms destroying homes just like ours, but we still welcome the rain. Dear Lord, may we give the volunteers the supply and the homeowners the assistance they need. We watch hopelessly as people, just like each one here, are without food, housing, or medical care. But we come with full stomachs, good housing, and good care. Father, we pray that wealthy nations and caring peoples will help supply their needs. Dear Father, forgive us for being selfish, always complaining, for soiling our beautiful earth, and yet we do nothing. 
But we still bring our petitions to you, trusting in your forgiveness for our failures and expecting answered prayer. Lord, we pray for this, our church, but also all churches who meet in your name and with whom you are pleased. We pray for the Elgin Association in the gathering this afternoon that the worship and fellowship will strengthen the, our ties with fellow churches in our con a county. We pray for our convention that proceedings there will be wise and pleasing to you. We thank you, Lord, for this, our church, for our pastor and his family, for Neil and the beautiful choir, for the bell choir and for the boys who play their guitars. We pray for the Sunday school and the youth groups and their leaders and to all committees and groups who meet regularly to provide worship, fellowship, and financial support. But Lord, we pray that more will come forward to serve and provide leadership because without this financial and fellowship support, there would be no church. We pray for the mission group and their planned mission support to the OASIS work. Give them traveling safety and personal blessings as they do your work. We thank you and pray for the work of the Flower Committee, the property workers, our caretaker and the secretary, <coughs> for the videoing of our services, the sound system tenders, the greeters and the ushers, Oh, Lord, we are so blessed with all these dear people. And now, Lord, we turn our thoughts and prayers to you for all our church family. Dear Jesus, we pray for those fighting dread diseases, for cancer, MS, breathing difficulties, or depression, and the list could go on. We ask you to bless the doctors, the nurses, and the researchers who do your work. We think and pray for those who have lost loved ones and who are uh, healing from recent illness or surgery, dealing with the broken relationships or the necessity of job hunting, or just unsure of what tomorrow may bring. Help us to strengthen our faith, Lord, and do your service. We pray for those in nursing homes and seniors' residents or confined to their own home, May they have peace, good care, and strong faith. And now, dear Father, we ask your blessings on this service and the guest who is doing your work. May his work, along with so many dedicated followers, assure that one day everyone will be able to drink a cup of clean water. Lord, accept our praise and worship as we pray together your prayer that you gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
serve the neighbors we have from you. Kneels at the feet of his friends, silently washes their feet. Master who acts as a slave to them. Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. Show out how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Neighbors are wealthy and poor, varied in color and race. Neighbors are near and far away. Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. These are the ones we should serve. These are the ones we should love. All these are neighbors to us and you. Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Loving puts us on our knees, silently washing their feet. This is the way we should live with you. Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. It's now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Larry Hudson. Larry is a retired OPP officer who lives in Tilsonburg. However, when he was an OPP, he was stationed in Owen Sound. He brings his wife, Sue, with him today. We're glad that he brought her along. And they have a blended family of three children. And he's here to bring us a story of his interest in clean water projects. Okay, volunteer service. As you can see, it's my opening slide. Serving not because you must, but because you are willing. As God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve. We are here to serve, not to be served. When I retired from the Owen Sound Police Service after my career with the OPP, I started my own job in Tilsonburg area, and then I became 65. And I said, time to wrap things up, it's time to retire. And I looked back at my career. I was blessed. 36 years of policing, never had a drama gun. I was salted once. Minor salt was a slap. <laughs> by a lady who had too much to drink. <laughs> and she was driving, so we had to eliminate that problem. But I look back over it, the things that uh, I imagined would happen, what I seen, everything. But just like footprints, someone was carrying me all along, kept me safe. So I decided, OK, how can I give back? Well, then through our church, our pastor was going on a trip with Samaritan's Purse to El Salvador. It was called Turn on the Tap by Samaritan's Purse. And as we know, we all need water. Water's life. Water's the life of Jesus. And it's all about clean water projects. So I started connecting up and going on short-term mission trips with Samaritan's Purse Canada. I had the great honor of meeting several different people, like-minded people like myself or fellow Christians, both in-country and the people I went around with. This is the group from El Salvador. It was my first mission trip. Uh, it was 
All these places, we complain about the cold. Well, every day it was approaching 90 to 95, and the humidity in these southern places is about 95%. So we worked hard, we did a lot of sweating, but it was warm. But we enjoyed each other's company, and we all believed in what we were doing. Bolivia, it was another trip. Uh, it was a long flight. We had to fly to Miami and then from Miami into uh, La Paz. And at La Paz, if you've ever been there, they have oxygen waiting for you in the aircraft terminal because it's very high. The airport's on top of the mountain. People, when they walk off a pressurized aircraft, they get lightheaded very quickly. But we flow in to the lower Amazon is where we actually were doing the water projects. So we flew through the mountains the first day. It was interesting, it was a foggy day, and we trust the pilots, we trust God that he's gonna get us there. Coming back to the airport, it was a clear day. We were flying between peaks of mountains, and they weren't very wide. But the pilot, he was going IFR going, visual coming back, but it's just amazing the country down there. Nicaragua. Uh, we were on an island in the largest freshwater lake in South America. And the next one, Haiti. Haiti was one of the most challenging trips I've been on. It was after the earthquake. And what we mainly did, uh, there was an orphanage set up for all the children that left, were left fatherless, motherless after the earthquake. So we were helping building this orphanage. And then the final one, Cambodia. It was called Water for Kids. As you can see in the background here, it's a very large setup. That is the Samaritan's Purse filter, but it's for a school and a village. It is much larger scale than the individual ones I was used to. And the next slide. This gentleman I met in Cambodia, he was 90 years young. I met and talked with him through an interpreter every single day. If you look at his shoulder, on his right shoulder, you're going to see sort of a greenish thing. That was a slingshot. And I asked him, why did he carry this slingshot every single day? He says, because I don't have to carry a rifle. Vietnam War, Cambodia, he went through that. By the way, I'm on my knee here. <laughs> we all worked hard. Uh, we enjoyed every minute when we, on these projects with the people who I was with. Okay, first, the, the way the Samaritan Purse filter is, it's a cement filter. It's a Canadian invention, University of Calgary. In the water department, whatever division of this university is, this gentleman uh, designed it and invented it years ago. There's probably maybe now a quarter of a million filters around the world through this invention. It is a design that is shipped to all these various countries I've been in. And every, the, the molds are the same. And you just keep on reproducing. First, we have to uh, take the molds all taken apart, and it's oiled, so the cement doesn't stick to it. And then we put an internal water tube. It's just the white tubing that gentlemen you use all the time, and it's plumbing in your house now and everything. It is put inside, and then uh, that's the tube sticking out at the bottom. That's the tube the actual water comes out of, the filtered water. Now, the mold is upside down because we pour from the bottom. And then uh, there's a bolt, you can't see it basically here. On the right hand side you'll see a, an, a bolt has got to hold it in position so it doesn't get into the sand part but it's within the cement wall of the internal filter. Then we fill the mold, uh, molds with cement. It's level off the bottom. Then 24 hours later we take it off. We take the mold apart. First of all, there's a large internal piece that would be the cavity where the sand and gravel goes. It is popped out, and how they pop it out, 
Here is they actually wrench it like a torque wrench and it pops and then they lift it out. And you can see them, they're lifting out the center portion of the mold here. This was Bolivia. They did it a little different. There were, there's smaller people, not as many in the crew making the filters. So they had this little lean to they made in their uh, area of work area and they pulled the center out. Now we're taking off the sides. Then we, you know, we had the sides taken off already. And this is the center portion. We're re-oiling again here. There they are. There's the filters. Uh, there, we fill them with water for 24 hours. Make sure there's no leaks through the cement. Then they're painted up and numbered. Then we load them aboard and we go to the individual homes in the villages of the area we're actually working in. Uh, this truck, we uh, loaded up. It took him three hours longer to get to the village where he was going because he had to go around the long way. We took the short way over a bridge. And this bridge, we got out of the pickup truck we're riding in. We walked across the bridge and let the chap drive across the bridge by himself. <laughs> it was some bridge. Uh, we were all humbled and experienced. This is why I always say to grandparents and parents alike, if they can afford it, have your children and grandchildren go on a mission trip. Their eyes will be opened. We have it so easy here in Canada. We all have homes, apartments. We have utensils, we have stoves. You'll see what they have. This is El Salvador. They're lucky to have the piece of tin to cover the roof. It sticks. This is how the people live in the country. Bolivia, thatch roofs. Basically, they have a lot of lumber because they're tearing down the Amazon. And they have board lumber up for the sides, but the roofs are just thatch. Nicaragua, same basic way. Haiti, well, they have cement homes, but their cement is made with the sand that has salt in it. Anybody know what happens to salt and cement? It doesn't last. That's why the hurricane and the uh, the earthquake they had did such tremendous damage and the homes crumbled because their sand has a salt base and it just it doesn't have the strength our cement does and that's uh, that was just showing a hillside outside of a, a, a poor little prince and it's just Louis square maybe 10 foot square homes they all lived in oh this is Nicaragua this is banana uh, grove and so we walked through to get to where we're going to install a filter in that. And we walked through this banana grove. Then it opened up in the middle of the banana grove and there was a family, two children, small children, man and wife. And basically their home again was tin for the roof. Around the outside was poles. They, they're tarps. Their side walls were tarps. Very clean, dirt floors. Cambodia, uh, they were, everything was raised in Cambodia. You'll see a picture later on that due to the floods they have. Like the floods in Quebec and Ontario and Bracebridge are nothing to what they have. When the monsoon comes through, they get 10 foot of water. So the homes are usually eight, six to eight foot up off the ground. This is why the Samaritan Purse water program is so important, these following slides. The water source was within 10 foot of a latrine. It was just a dug well. The building in the background is the latrine. They get their drinking water from that cistern right there in that well. Next one. Bolivia, river water all river water. And by the way, there is piranha in those rivers. We actually went fishing one day and we caught piranha. 
You can eat them too. They cooked them up for us. Uh, oh, this is uh, Cambodia. Rainy season, they fill these vats. You see the vats there? When the water runs out of those vats, the next slide will show you what they drink. See that green? There's a bit of a dock there. That's a pond. And that's what they take their water from. We were blessed to bring God's love and joy to the people we were serving on these trips. Turn on the tap. This is a lady receiving uh, $7.95, I believe it is. When, this, when I did up this slide, they had over 6,000 stalled by then. It's over 10,000 now. In Bolivia, they're getting their filter, a family. Now, this is the top of the filter. This is where you pour the water in. That's what they were drinking. That cup. Next slide. Her right hand is the river water. Her left hand is the water out of this filter. After three weeks, it's 99.99% .99 pure. And it's simple. This filter, as you can see, it's not very large. It's heavy. It's about over 100 pounds because it's concrete. But it's layers of gravel, large gravel, smaller gravel, normal sand and the filtering sand and the and what happens is when the water goes into the top through a diffusing plate which we make up too it's just a, a plate that sits on top and it's many holes so when you pour the water in with your bucket from your stream from wherever you're getting your water it doesn't make a hole in the upper layer of sand it drips through and this layer of sand which should be four to six inches what happens a reaction happens. All the bad bugs, there's good bugs there, and they interact and it kills all the parasites. And the only thing you have to do to these filters to keep the maintenance up is change about two inches of a slime form on top of the sand. They change that out, put fresh sand in, and you continue on. That's how simple it is. What a creation by God through a gentleman in Calgary. A simple filter. In Ethiopia, they have got over 100,000 filters installed. They've been doing it for over 20 years. And so the number of people that are not having diseases, typhoid, a lot of the diseases caused are di diarrhea type diseases. You can imagine the children and the adults. They lose uh, about a, a child once every three minutes dies from this type of a disease in the world. And it's all from unfiltered water coming directly out of a river where their cattle are drinking and doing whatever. There's fish, there's other animals desiccating within the river they're drinking that and that's why this filter is so important even though after the filters are checked we uh, this Samaritan's Purse in-house team will go around checking on the filters making sure the operation is working properly so they do checks and make sure they know they're doing it the proper way they're you know the biggest thing we found was that we give them, uh, they got the clean water, but then they stored the water in a dirty bucket. So it's defeated the whole purpose. So it's an educational process to get them to think about once you put this water into your container, make sure you cover the container, make sure it's clean and not. There was one lady in El Salvador she had a cement type sink and then a little, I, it's like the stoves I remember in my grandmother's house. They used to have a water, the, the coal stove and the wood stove had a water jacket a container for hot water. Well, she had this in the cement thing. She had fish in that area 
little fish eating the algae to keep the water kind of clear. She had fish eating the algae, but that's what she would dip in and that's what they would drink. Cambodia, oh yeah, about six foot high. Some of them weren't quite that, five foot above. We're installing a filter here, we're putting the sand in. Uh, us people that are heights challenged, uh, we had to bend over quite a bit. We hit our heads quite a bit. We stood up and we were hitting the rafters. Now, there's other projects, Samaritan's Purse, that's basically the water project. But Samaritan's Purse doesn't only do water projects. They also do other projects that are very helpful to the local citizens of the country we're in. There was a need in Haiti after the earthquake. The, uh, the local doctor, they approached him and said, what can we do for you? He says, I need a medical clinic for pregnant ladies. There's no services for ladies for childbirth than that. So Samaritan's Purse put together a team. Uh, it took them about a year and a half to do this. We were about halfway through here. And we came and we helped a few days when we were in, in country that year. And you can see the little rooms. I, f I think there was 12 rooms. There's going to be 12 little examining rooms for the doctor and his clients. So we, that was the first medical clinic in this whole area. It was an actually going to be a medical, but Samaritan's Purse Canada sponsored the, all the monies and uh, the wages. And uh, by the way, in Haiti, the cement, their sand, Samaritan's Purse imports it from the states by boat, the sand, so we don't have that problem of the salt and the sand mix making poor cement. They actually import it. So a truckload of sand in Haiti costs, say, $50. A truckload of sand from the states is $500 U.S. So. But that's what you have to do to make sure the project is sustained and goes on for years. Oh, bicycle repair. El Salvador, main mode of transportation was bicycles. By the thousands. So we all were asked to bring things down. Use parts. Not new parts, use parts. Well, connections through the church fellow in Mount Elgin that used to repair bicycles went out of business and made a visit. He wanted to give me his whole shop. I says, we're flying on airplanes. So we packed as much as we could and went down. The day we showed up, there was over 500 people with their bike waiting. <laughs> we, we said, we'll never get through them. We got through them all. Our team of 12 people got through everybody's bike. We had to, instead of fixing the front and rear brakes, back only. So we had to cut it down what we were going to do to the bikes. We started off trying to repair everything. If you can imagine a bicycle, pedals, and they're rubber, imagine them gone, so you just have a rod that comes out, and it was used so much the rod was to a point, like you would do a punch, we brought some back. I haven't got them with me, but we brought them back with us. They, rode, they ride their bikes that often and that long, as long as they can. Tube within a tube, tire within a tire. Like an old tire that is shot. To put another tire over top of it to keep on riding their bikes. But, so bicycle clinic was well worth it and needed within the village we were at. Eyeglass Clinic, Nicaragua. I know optician. But one gentleman on our team from Calgary was trained how to do a manual eyeglass clinic. And we brought the glasses down with us. By the way, I'm also a Lions Club member. You know the little box that says glasses? Please put your used glasses in them. Because that's the glasses we use down where we went. They're, they're all shipped to Calgary area. Uh, believe it or not, uh, a penal institution and the people that are there they take the glasses apart they size them they repair all the glasses read they're they're trained how to get you know 250 125 or whatever it is 
and uh, they're packaged up in little envelopes. So when we know the prescription that is close, we just go and then we give them two or three and the ladies get two or three different pairs to choose. And uh, there's the glasses all laid out. I think we had 250 pair of glasses and I think the gentleman went back to Calgary with maybe 20. So they all got eye glasses. Uh, they were fitting a gentleman back there in red. And next one. Now, the gentleman in the forefront, he was the one that was the one trained out of Calgary. He's holding a piece of paper and you're going to notice it looks like a big E. You know how the, all the different letters, you know, when you go and get your eyes checked, I just had mine checked uh, this week, past week actually, on Tuesday I think it was. You read them all. Well, Spanish, English, how do we converse with the people? The chart uh, Jack is pointing to, he's got a pointer there, it's just like the charts we have, but it's like this, like this, like this, or like that the letter E. So it's, it's round, but they're up, this one up, and it gets smaller in size, then you get down to 20, 20. And all you do is point, and then the person receiving the service will say up, that way, that way, or down. And that's, we know what they can read. So very simple. They've really simplified it, but it works. Uh, you can't quite make out the smile on her face. She's smiling from ear to ear. And how we know that the eyeglasses are proper for them, we give them a Bible, and they read from the Bible, and it's a very small Bible, like the, not the size we have here in the church. It's a small little version, so a small print. If they can read that with their glasses, we know what we've done. Sometimes that's the first time they've read their Bible in years. There's a gentleman, he's also very happy, you can see now. Oh, the staff housing, we mainly worked on the staff housing at uh, Greta House in Haiti. Uh, we put all the windows in, uh, the hurricane windows, they call them. They're special windows from the States. Uh, I wondered why, what they were so special about them. Gentlemen, you know the front windshield of your car? It's got plastic between the layers of glass. So when a rock or something hits the front windshield, it just shatters. You just see all the, the spider prowl. That's what a hurricane window is. And so all these windows were manufactured that way. So mainly we did that part of it. We worked on the soccer field and some other things. Birthday parties at the orphanage. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. There's a young fellow receiving a gift and then the one more slide, I think. And he got a couple toys. Now, it's pretty sad why they hold these birthday parties. Mom and Dad have died in the earthquake. The village has been wiped out. These kids are orphans. So they go to Greta House, and they try to find from a local person when the child was born. They don't know. They figure maybe the spring. How many years ago? So they say, okay, they look at the calendar and say, we don't have too many birthdays in June. So the child's birthday becomes June, whatever. That's how it is. There's no records kept in Haiti. So they don't even know their date of birth, but they have a birthday party for them all, every year. So that was the birthday parties we're involved in. Operation Christmas Child, we've all heard of that. I had uh, the pleasure and the honor of participating in one. And it's quite a, it's something else to see those kids get those shoe boxes. That was also in Haiti. Oh, typical kitchen setup in every place I've gone. Wood burning, usually not very much enclosed, but sometimes they were enclosed in an alcove. Uh, you can imagine starting your wood fire, the smoke coming up, the lady of the house is breathing in all that smoke, like a firefighter does, fighting a fire. But he wears a gas mask. They're not wearing gas masks. 
Next slide. There's another one. You can just see how they, they do it. They cook their things and open fire within an enclosure because of rain and heat and that. Samaritan's Purse came up with an idea of its cement. Again, it's cement. It's a cement cook stove. Uh, you can just barely see it there. The dark part at the bottom of the picture is where the logs, your branches, whatever, go in. It's a metal portion of that, and there's two cook plates. And that large thing going up is a chimney. No more smoke within the kitchen area. It's still in the same kitchen area, but it's the health of the lady of the house mainly is much improved. They don't have to breathe the smoke anymore. We take all this for granted. These people don't have this. But so now this has started. Another project they do. Savings group. This is in Cambodia. What they did, it's basically a credit union. Is the easiest way I can describe it. Smyrna's purse came, got the leaders of the community and that, and said, okay, we'll all put in. So it's a credit union. And then they farm out, they do loans, and they start a little home business. So it's a savings group, they call it, but it's basically, we know it as a credit union here in Canada. Uh, Co-op group, uh, they're meeting out of here, you can't see them uh, due to the picture they're underneath. Uh, the shade area, uh, basically, as you know, a co-op buys in volume. Well, the farmers would have to buy from their local, well, wherever they got the fertilizer for the rice. Cambodia is all rice. So say they were paying $20 a bag for the fertilizer, they needed to grow the rice. They formed their own co-op, cut out the middleman, and went to the driven, now they're only paying $5 a bag. They formed their own co-op. They had never had any concept of these ideas, which has been in Canada for 100 years plus, probably. That's uh, a chicken farm was started. Simple little businesses, a chicken farm for laying eggs. We actually stayed at this place uh, when we were in Bolivia. There's put up Samaritan's Purse, loaned him the money to set up the pen, to get his chickens, and that. And next slide. The lady of the house, that's her oven, by the way. It's uh, like an old pizza oven, I would classify it as. Uh, she baked bread and rolls, put them out at the side of the road. This is how honest the people are. All the eggs and all that, side of the road, right? All the loaves of bread and all that. The locals would come along. There was a bucket there, it's just the honor system, like the Mennonite population does at their little corner stores, and that's how the bread and eggs were sold. Every day, they were gone. Everything was gone. She supplied the bread. It was good bread, too. Cambodia, next to Thailand. Okay, if you can see it, what this slide is, uh, the sign that was at the school. The picture on the left, it shows school children talking at a school. They have two paths to follow, the upper path or the lower path. The upper path is go to school, become the leaders of your country. The lower path, since they, we were Thailand border, I, I seen the Thai border, that's how far west we were in Cambodia, is they're pointing in the middle slide, they're, he's pointing to Thailand. And, uh, and the parents would honestly allow their children, because there was no work in Cambodia, to go into Thailand to work. Kids. The dad was already over there working, so the kids went also. And then the, the last slide is showing a child pushing a wheelbarrow. It's basically almost I hate to use the term, but it's slave labor. So Samaritan's Purse said, we've got to develop something to educate the parents and the children. This is not the proper stay in. So that's why the saving group was formed. 
So when the gentleman is way in Thailand on a fishing boat or something, they can start their own business where they have money. Because basically what happened, the gentleman went away for six months. He came back with a wad of cash like that, but there was a wad of bills like that, that the mother and the children had run up credit. So it was gone. So it was just a vicious cycle. So now the ladies were forming these small businesses at home. So when the gentleman gets home, there's money. The kids are well fed. There's food and, and the, he has the extra money from his job in Thailand on a fishing boat or something. So that's why Samaritan's Purse developed the co-ops, the credit unions, I'll say, and this program of keeping educating everybody, don't go to Thailand because it's not worth it. They actually, they weren't allowed back. Samaritan's Purse has actually gone over and brought kids back from Thailand, back into Cambodia. That's a video showing what happens to the children. This is about a grade eight class. They're showing this video to try to educate. It's in their native language and that. And now, I went to Cambodia because there's a different filter system. It's a Samaritan's filter, they call it. It's for schools. That's basically it. The high tank on the, the top on the left is the raw water. The middle tank, they're all plastic, is the filter. And then there's a holding tank. Now this would supply 300 children and the village of water for the day. That's what this, t the next slide will show you actually one right there. That's how large it is. It's a fairly large operation. But it's the same principle. The same sand, the gravel, everything else is the same. But it's just on a much larger scale. Uh, at the bottom of the filter tank, that's where the water is filtered through. It goes into this tube. Uh, the ladies are drilling holes and it goes into the holding tank where the fresh water and pure water is. Uh, someone's got to get inside the tank to install this <laughs> at the bottom of it. So we picked on the smallest person we could. I couldn't fit in the tank. <laughs> but she got in and success, she came out of it after. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, we're hooking up the raw water to the main filter here. Uh, we're washing the sand. The sand's got to be washed all the, before it goes into the uh, tank and the gravel's got to be washed too. And then we pour it in and you can see that's that collection tube at the bottom. That's the coarser gravel at the bottom. If we had sand there, you can imagine the little holes that we have in this, that blue tubing would all fill up and then the filter would plug and then we would have to empty everything. So that's why the gravel. Oh, back one up. Uh, to show you the size of it, 100 kilo of gravel, 600 kilo of sand goes on top. With the one that we were installing in the homes, five kilo of gravel and 40 kilo of sand. So you can see the difference in size of the filters. Uh, there's a water cutoff valve when uh, the filter backs up. When the holding tank is full of fresh water, it, it triggers a little cutoff. It's simple. And then that stops the water from coming in from the raw, raw, raw water tank above it. And it's all gravity fed. It's all gravity fed. Finished after a week, the water is drinkable, by the way. After a week, three weeks, it's really pure, but after one week, it's, you can drink it. And every place I went, I drank the water. I made a point of asking for a glass of water in every little home I've, out of their filter. Because they say, oh, what are this white man? Is this a con game? No, it's drinkable. It's good water. It's excellent water. So I always, that's all, all we drank in El Salvador. We had four filters to sell for the crew, and we just kept on filling our water bottles up. That's the construction team of this one filter we put in at a school. Their school doesn't start until November, not like ours. It's November, because they're doing crops, like the farmers do here, but they keep their children till November before they go back to school. That's our third installation. That's actually at the school we were staying at. We, we slept on the cement floors of a school, in the classroom. 
That's, that was our accommodations for that three weeks. Also, at every one of these school filter projects they do, they do one other project. This is the washrooms. And you can see just behind the gentleman, you can see a cross. It's in that uh, brick that you can't see through. Uh, used for washrooms, we can buy it, it's in little four inch squares. They put it in a cross and the girls and the boys either side. And that's a septic bed where the flowers are and everything else, that's the septic bed. So they grow their flowers and stuff on top of that. But every single place, again, we have to, we're, the education of trying to get pure water and always have it clean as much as possible. And what to do with sewage, it's a septic take, uh, system. So that's built by Samaritan's Purse also. Uh, every day in Cambodia and the other places it was, we came back from say eight hours in the field the kids of the village were waiting for us because we brought a lot of stuff for the kids. So we did games and Christian stories and a lot of things. And the next slide is Cambodia. One person of the church I was attending, she gave me money and I said, I don't need any more money. I, there's all the money for the trip. I don't, well, use it. Okay, I'll use it. Soccer balls. So I went in country, bought a bunch of soccer balls, and now the kids of this village have soccer balls. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. The team was able to construct three school filters, the big filters, 39 biosand filters for the homes during our first week in Cambodia. You go on one of these trips, you're busy. You're very busy, but you work, you go to bed at dark, which is five o'clock, you get up at daylight, which is basic five, six in the morning, do devotions and that, and go out to work, come back, play with the kids, have supper, you're back to bed. So, This is a prayer I've always stated every day when I'm on these trips. Lord Jesus, I volunteer your service and freely give myself to those who would benefit from my efforts. Make me your servant. Make me strong when I am feeble. Use me, Lord, to show you up to others. May the work I do, whether clumsily and limited or effective and far-reaching, reveal you. May my efforts influence others to seek the shelter of your saving grace. Every day. Keeps me going. Thank you. Thanks very much, Larry, for bringing us a story of a reality that certainly none of us here lives. Uh, most of us are unaware of a lot of the challenges. We pray for mission work all over the world and we ask for a special blessing on our own mission trip that is coming up soon. Uh -huh.